Grade 11, IT Theory, Module 1.1a, Hardware. We're going to talk about modular design in the computer. That just simply means that there are separate computer components which make up your computer. Um, the, there's the motherboard, and into the motherboard you can plug in all sorts of things, and you can plug in peripherals, and this makes up your computer. The good thing about this is it makes it easier to repair the computer and also you can upgrade things on your computer more easily because of the modular design. First thing we need to look at is all the sockets and slots and connectors that make modular design possible. There's the ZIF socket or zero insertion force socket. This is where your C CPU plugs in. You can see the lever on the side which you could lift up and then it insert your CPU easily so that the little pins don't get bent. Then there are the DIMM slots or dual inline memory module slots where your um, RAM or DIMM can plug in and um, they look like this. You get the SATA connectors which is for you to, to connect to the hard drive and your external connectors which are your USB and VGA um, connectors. And then you get the expansion slots, like these PCI slots. There's also ISO and MCA and EISA, which are older technology. Then PCI and um, the latest PCI Express, AGP, which is for your graphics card, and PCIe. The motherboard has three important functions, three reasons why it was designed like that. It provides connections for other circuits. Um, the RAM um, and the CPU, as we just saw. And then also it ensures communication between the components. If you look at the back of the motherboard, you will see this is the back of the CPU on the motherboard. You can see all the little wires that have been um, printed onto the circuit board. They're actually little copper wires, but they're covered in yellow plastic and they allow communication between all the components or between the CPU and other components. Um, the motherboard also provides connection to power. The power supply is plugged into the motherboard and then travels through the motherboard to provide power to other components. The machine cycle is what goes on in your CPU all the time. There are four steps, fetch, decode, execute, store. So what these mean is the fetch side part is when the next, the data and instructions are fetched from RAM or from memory. The decode part is where the instruction gets decoded or separated into what is the command and what is the data part. Step three is when the arithmetic logic unit or ALU, which is in the CPU, it executes the instruction. And step four is when the data gets sent back to memory, whatever the result of the instruction was that gets sent back to memory. RAM consists of these dual inline memory modules, which are basically little thin green strips of um, PC boards with a whole lot of little chips on. And um, it's called dual inline memory module because there are these little gold pins to plug into the board. They're on both sides of the board. It used to be a SIM card um, when there was only one side printed, but these days they are dual inline. RAM has the following characteristics. It is electronic, so there are no moving parts, and it's also called solid state memory. It is fast and much, much faster than your magnetic hard drive because there are no moving parts. It's fully electronic. It is made to be fast. Um, RAM is also volatile. There is 
if you, there is no power on the RAM, then the RAM loses all of its contents. It is comparatively expensive per gigabyte in comparison with storage. So one gigabyte of RAM is far more expensive than one gigabyte, which would be part of your magnetic hard drive. RAM is limited by the number of memory addresses that can be accessed. So if you have a 32-bit operating system, you can access far less RAM, only 4 gigabytes, than if you have a 64-bit operating system, then you can access a whole lot more. And also the number of memory or RAM slots which are on your printed on your motherboard will limit the, num the amount of RAM you can put on, on into your computer. Another type of memory on the computer is your ROM or read-only memory. ROM is different because it does not lose its contents when the power goes off. But it's not a scratch pad like RAM is a bit of a scratch pad where you keep on reading and writing the whole time that the computer is on. The CPU is constantly communicating with the RAM and writing to the RAM. ROM is different. Um, it's not meant to be written to. ROM is also found on many other electronic devices. And the software on the ROM is called firmware. Firm because it does not change often. So why do we need to have ROM and RAM? ROM contains a little program called the BIOS, which the BIOS is your basic input-output system. It actually controls the hardware at the lowest level on the computer. Um, the BIOS has been put into your ROM. When you buy a computer, the BIOS is already in the ROM. The BIOS also allows the user to configure a whole lot of options on his computer. And when the BIOS runs, it checks that the rest of the hardware is present and working on the computer. This is your power on self-test or the post. Once this has been run, um, then the BIOS goes to find the operating system. It's somewhere on the hard drive, but it finds it. And then it loads the operating system into RAM so that the computer can start operating normally. Then the third type of, of memory, which is on the motherboard, is called CMOS. So the one, when the BIOS runs, it has a whole lot of settings which it needs to store somewhere. And these are stored in the CMOS. CMOS would also lose its contents if it didn't have power. So it is run by a little battery, um, which gives it a small trickle of power and keeps it, um, prevents it from losing its, its contents. The date and clock of the computer are also kept running by the battery. You can actually look at the BIOS settings of your computer by doing the following. You can turn off your computer and just wait a little while to make sure it's really off. Then turn the computer on and while it's switching on, keep pressing the F10 key until the BIOS setup screen appears and you will then see the types of settings which are stored in the CMOS. In other devices, um, ROM also is, can be found and would also have firmware. An example would be when the printer driver in your computer receives a print instruction from the operating system and translates it. It would be translating it into a command that the firmware in the printer can understand. That's where the firmware comes in. Also, on on smartphones and tablets, the operating system is stored in the firmware. So how is the firmware upgraded and why? A device will function faster sometimes and also be able to, to do new functions once the firmware has been upgraded. So remember that ROM 
these days ROM is actually EEPROM. When ROM was first created, it was really read-only memory. It was programmed once and that was that. You could never reprogram it. But today we have electronically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. And it can be totally wiped clean and replaced with a new version of software when it is flashed. Uh, a flash is actually a higher voltage, which is just put onto one pin for a short while, and this cleans up, makes sure that the memory is cleaned out. Um, that is why it's so important not to interrupt the process of upgrading firmware. If you do, you might land up with no firmware on your EEPROM at all. Typical types of devices that need ROM firmware upgraded would be smartphones, tablets, GPSs, and video cards. So, what is a video or graphics card? As you can see here, it is a card that would plug into, do you see the gold pins at the bottom, would plug into the motherboard. And the silver part at the back is visibly is visible on the outside of your desktop um, um, case so that you can plug in a monitor there. The video card has a GPU which is your graphics processing unit and also its own RAM. What it does is to create images and send them to the monitor to be displayed. Remember that images take a lot of processing power. They have many, many pixels which need to be generated in the right colors. And especially with the high resolution that we have on our monitors, this takes a lot of processing power. So having a GPU on the graphics card lessens the burden on the CPU. If the, if the graphics card wasn't there, the CPU would be doing all this work. Now, laptops have actually a built-in or integrated video adapter on the motherboard, and they often have a separate little video card on the more powerful laptops. And then what they do is they switch between these two graphics adapters to, to save battery power. So when you're doing the type of tasks that do not need fancy pictures, it will use the integrated video adapter. Whereas if you're doing gaming or other applications which require fancy graphics, then it switches to using the video card. Remember that a video card uses a lot more battery power. The types of connectors that are used for um, graphics cards are DVI, VGA, S-Video, HDMI and Crossfire. 